and I too want to thank the initiatives for China, Dr. Yang Jianli and Daniel Fung, for organizing this conference and inviting me to speak at the National Endowment for Democracy and the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy for supporting it. <coughs> To convene a conference on how to bring people together from different ethnicities and religious faiths in a spirit of mutual respect to build a more just and peaceful world might at first seem an ordinary goal. Who could possibly oppose it? It's a sad comment, comment in our times that a conference like this is not only appropriate, but necessary. And not only necessary, but urgent. People in China, including in Tibet and Xinjiang, people in Burma, people in many other parts of the world are suffering right now as we speak because of these unobjectionable goals of decency, mutual respect, and cooperation uh, do not set well with the political power interests of people who rule in these places. We will hear in this conference from distinguished thinkers and able speakers on a wide variety of related topics, religion, ethnicity, cultural differences, and ideals about democratic government and nonviolent methods of resolving differences. Speakers will say that differences of culture ethnicity and religion are natural, and that they should be not threatening, that we should lay these differences before us and celebrate the variety that they represent, that all religions and cultures are authentic human responses to life on this planet that we share. In that sense, none of them is false, and each of them is equally legitimate. Where they seem to conflict or to compete, that is natural and also nothing to fear. The speakers at this conference will remind us. Let different human ideas compete in the sunlight that everyone shares. And let every person make choices, even while respecting fellow human beings who make other choices. Why not? Moreover, there is no need for coercion or violence in any of this. <coughs> Respecting differences is a beautiful and a necessary goal, which I fully support. But the point I want to make this morning is that it is a relatively superficial way to view the issue that our conference is addressing. All of us can realize if we, re if we reflect for a moment, that the most profound truth about human differences is that they are, in fact, extremely small. Human beings differ in, their, in our DNA by half a percent at most. Our physical features show far more commonalities than differences. We all have two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, 10 fingers, some of us have 12 fingers to be sure. Our nervous systems operate in the same ways. If I step on your toe, your toe hurts. If you step on my toe, my toe hurts. And facts like these are true regardless of what religion, ethnicity, or language group either of us belongs to. And human commonalities extend into more deeply emotional and spiritual areas as well. Try this little thought experiment. You're looking at a photograph of a young woman in a war scene. The young woman is looking at a dead baby that she holds in her arms. What is she feeling? Is her heart breaking? Do you have to know her ethnicity, her religion, or what language she speaks in order to know that her heart is breaking? With so many obvious similarities among human beings, the real question we need to reflect upon is why we spend so much time noticing the differences. 
The answer, I think, is not hard to find. We focus on the differences because the commonalities are boring. Everyone has two ears, two eyes, two nostrils. So there's no need to raise these topics. No one would say, hey, look at her. She seems to have 10 fingers. We point someone out only when she is unusual in some way, especially tall, especially pretty, or perhaps she is standing on her hands, or is dressed in peacock feathers, or something like that. It is the same in intellectual debate. At university seminars, and perhaps in our conference these three days, the audience might agree with 95% of what a speaker says, but during the question period, we'll focus on the 5% where there is disagreement, because that is the interesting part. It would be boring to spend time on the 95% of agreement simply confirming everything. So should we celebrate our differences after all? Yes, we still should. We learn by comparing them, and all of us are open to improvement by borrowing <coughs> things that other human beings have invented. World cuisine is an excellent example of this. There is French food, Thai food, Turkish food, we celebrate the variety. Where we don't choose to borrow, we can easily live and let live, eat and let eat in mutual respect. It is generally harder to do this with, with religions, but here too, we should try. We need to remember, however, that it is not the differences, but those boring commonalities that are still by far the biggest facts in the matter of comparing human beings. We need to remember this because of the dangerous human tendency to allow the differences to dominate. I call this a human tendency because I think it lies deep in human nature, probably related to ways in which we have evolved. Human beings enjoy identifying with groups. It gives us a kind of security to do so as well as a basis on which to be rivals with other groups. But subgroups of humanity cannot be marked off by using commonalities as the criteria. Having two eyes or two ears, for example, cannot define any subgroup for obvious reasons. Therefore, the subgroups have to be defined by those relatively superficial differences, ethnicity, religion, dialect, local custom, and so on. The human tendency to see subgroupings is so strong that we even invent ways to be different solely for this purpose. We sometimes form groups for the purpose, sometimes the only purpose, of rivalry with other groups. Sports teams are a good example of this, although parallels are easy to find in the worlds of business, education, religion, politics, and elsewhere. Consider the Beijing Ducks and the Jilin Tigers, two professional basketball teams in China. If a sociologist came down from Mars to look at them, he would say they are behaving in exactly the same way. They wear shorts, bounce a ball around a rectangular area, try to throw the ball to the end. Their fans, too, behave identically. They shout, cheer, eat snacks, wear t-shirts that show support for their team. But for all of their similarities, these two groups want to think that they are different. Indeed, opposite. We are the ducks. You are the tigers. The differences are very important. But they are desired differences, invented differences. The underlying values of the behavior are the same. There is no harm in allowing this paradox so long as we remember that the inventive differences 
段的电视上照片，就不是视频。他们不可以被允许去带有些危险的表情，有时候会有一些挺强人的表情。在他们的片子解释上，我们好干。这段挖角这边。On October 17, as you see, I recorded at four minutes past five o'clock in California an earthquake measuring 6.9 on the Richter scale struck the San Francisco Bay Area. It happened during a warm-up for a World Series baseball game between the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland Athletics. These teams were intense rivals. And had attracted followings with the local populace that saw themselves in a baseball context as polar opposites. The two groups were cheering their own team, booing the opposite team, and taunting each other when the earthquake struck. The great stadium rocked for 10 or 15 seconds, terrifying everyone. No one knew whether parts of the huge structure might collapse and crush them. When the shaking was over, people sat in shock, according to press reports. The taunting was gone. Even the idea of two sides melted away. Are you all right? People asked one another. They shared their water. They shared their blankets. And it did not matter which team's colors were on those blankets. Now everyone were fellow human beings, not Giants fans or athletics fans. The earthquake had shaken them into perceiving superficialities to cause us to forget about the boring bedrock of our common humanity. It is fine to identify our differences, to respect them, and even to celebrate them. But it is a mistake to celebrate them for very long, because that can lead us to assign them even more weight than they deserve. Compared to what we share in common, they actually weigh very little. This kind of vision is what led Vaslav Havel to comment that an assault, an assault on human dignity in Prague is an not far here in California. It's hard to answer that question quickly, of course. Uh, I remember when I was in China in the 1980s, studying Chinese literature and meeting people who have taught me a lot about China, like Liu Yinye, a famous journalist. Or Fang Major, the astrophysicist who just passed away. And in the 1980s, they were calling the Chinese government Liu <laughs> Mangzhe, And you know, I was critical of the Chinese government starting in the late 1970s. So these words were not strange to me, but still, I felt startled. Really? The, the Liu Mangzhang, who it seemed like an extreme point of view. But Fang is a scientist. He, I don't think he was speaking in an exaggerated way. He was describing the way the top leadership of the Communist Party of China treats one another. And to me, the Boise Lai affair, like the Liu Biao affair in 1971, and others in between, is a chance for the outside world to see briefly what really is normal inside the way the leadership works. I know it sounds unfriendly to say these things, but the mafia, the way he runs in the United States, you know, what, there's a godfather and there's a group at the top, and. It's hierarchical from the top to the bottom, and when necessary, people are killed. Really is uh, not a bad model for describing the way the Communist Party of China operates. So when Liu Binyan and Fang Zhu said Liu Mengzhong at the time, I was reading that. That's 